this morning, Psalm 94. And it's a very mm, grab you kind of psalm because it's about evil. It's about political corruption. And it's about a God of vengeance, a very strong term. In fact, it's the only time in the Bible per se that God is called the God of vengeances. But the rabbis will point out in the Talmud, Brachot 33a, the opening line of this psalm, El, and El is the name for God throughout the ancient Middle East. El of vengeances is Adonai. And in the Talmud they'll say the word nekamot, vengeances, is between two of God's names, which is to say that vengeance is embraced by God in the context, this is really very important, of moral outrage, that there's a place for moral outrage that requires even by God vengeance. And although God only here in this powerful psalm is called the God of vengeances, there is a line in Moses' closing poem called Ha'azinu, that long song at the end of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses will sing of God in God's voice. Li nakam, to me is vengeance, v'shalem, and compensation, la'at tamut raglam, for waiting for the slipping of their feet, as if God's vengeance will come about through those who do evil, which in Deuteronomy 32, the people are equated with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, which in the Bible is the epitome of mean-spiritedness, when visitors to a city were treated as enemies. And so, God in Deuteronomy 32 is saying of God in Moses' song, I seek vengeance, but the vengeance will be I'm waiting for them to slip on their own feet. And that's what will happen in this psalm, in the closing line. The enemies will be done in by their own devices. And I will point out how that's a reoccurring theme in psalms. The notion that those who are the evildoers will ultimately fall into the own pit that they dug for others they will fall into. Well, a comment about why this is the Psalm for Wednesday, and then I'll read the Psalm. The Talmud in Rosh Hashanah 31a designates each day what Psalm the Levites were to sing in the temple. The only psalm that has a inscription of a day is the Song of the Sabbath. But on that basis, they designated a psalm for each day for the Levites to have sung. And Psalm 94 will complete for us all the seven days of the week. So in the course of our study, this will have been the last of the daily designations. Fourth day, you may recall the Scopes Trial in America in which evolution and creationism were presented in court and in which it was pointed out by Clarence Darrow, the great lawyer, that the sun and the moon aren't put in the sky until the fourth day. And therefore, when the Bible talks about the seven days of creation, if the sun and the moon aren't in the sky till the fourth day, they're not days in 24-hour periods. So why the fourth day? The Talmud would say, because there, this is a psalm against idolatry. And it's the sun and the moon that were so widely worshipped in ancient times. And so this is the psalm of the day of the fourth day of creation to remind us, do not worship the sun and the moon. And in fact, elsewhere in the Talmud, it will say, that when you walk by a pagan temple that's been destroyed, this is the line that you are to recite, this psalm. One, one a little aside, Maimonides, 
will raise the question, why did people come to worship the sun and the moon so after creation, you know, in the Bible? If God is the creator and God has an interface with Adam and then with Noah, how did they become worshipers of the sun and the moon? And so Maimonides will address this and say, the sun and the moon originally were seen as examples of God's creation, manifestations of God's handiwork. But at a certain point, people forgot what was behind the symbol, and they began to worship the sun and moon, forgetting that they were just symbols of the Creator who can't be seen. And so that when a means becomes the end, that is idolatry. All right, with that, a powerful psalm for our time in some ways, Psalm 94, and then some commentary. I mentioned at the beginning that my beloved teacher passed away on Sunday. His name was Abraham Tversky, and I do hope to have a moment to talk a little bit about why he's such an important teacher for me and to tell a Hasidic story about Psalm 94 in his honor. But first, the psalm, which I entitle, Ale of Vengeances. And again, from the first verse, the word Ale is the generic name of God in Canaan, in the ancient Middle East. And the word Elohim has Ale embedded in it. This psalm will be divided into four parts, just to have a heads up. Verses 1 to 7 are a description of desperation. Verses 8 to 11, a lecture to the evildoers. Verses 12 to 15, patience for the righteous. And then verses 16 to 23, are a personal description of relationship with God, culminating in the last syllable of the psalm, which is the word us, leading to us. This is a psalm that does not describe a particular moment. It could be written either against corrupt officials in Israel or widely read in the Middle Ages as a messianic psalm against Israel's enemies and a messianic future of justice. El of vengeances is Adonai. El of vengeances appear. Rise up, judge of the earth. Return back what is deserved upon the arrogant, al Geim. Until when the wicked, Adonai, until when will the wicked exult? They freely utter and declare falsehoods. They glorify themselves, all workers of iniquity. Your people, Adonai, they crush, and your heritage they afflict. Widow and resident alien they kill, and orphans they murder. And they say, Yah will not see, and the God of Jacob will not discern. Let them discern boors amidst the people. Fools, when will you grow wise? Who implants the ear? Shall not God hear? If God fashion the eye, shall not God see? Who chastises nations, shall not God correct? Who teaches a mortal knowledge? Adonai knows the thoughts of a mortal, for they are vanity. Happy is the mighty person whom you you chastise Adonai, and from your Torah whom you teach, to grant quiet to such from the days of evil until is dug for the wicked a pit. For you will not cast off Adonai God's people, and God's inheritance you will not abandon. For until justice returns judgment, and following after it are all the upright of heart. Who will rise up for me? amongst the evildoers, who will stand firmly for me amongst the workers of iniquity? Were not Adonai a help for me, readily my spirit would have dwelt in silence. When I have said, my foot has slipped, 
your kindness, Adonai, has supported me with so many of my upsets within me. Your comforting soothes my spirit. Will you associate with a seat of scheming, a fashioner of mischief through statute? They gather together against the spirit of the righteous and innocent blood they condemn as evil. But Adonai is to me a high tower, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And God will turn back upon them their own wrongs, and with their own evil cut them down. Cut them down, Adonai, our God. Strong, strong, even again the opening of God of vengeances, and it's in the plural. Usually, many commentators today choose to entitle this God of retribution, uncomfortable with the calling of God, a God of vengeance. Retribution seems to embody justice and equity. But here, the choice in the Hebrew of nikma, vengeance, conveys rage. This is a psalm in which the psalmist is raging against the injustices by those who have political power. And I say political power because see, look here at the end. Will you associate with a seed of scheming, a fashioner of mischief through statute. Verse 20, they gather together against the spirit of the righteous and innocent blood. They condemn as evil, implying a legislative and a judicial power that is used by those with clout to take advantage of the wicked. And the punchline, verse 23, and I'm pacing myself a little bit less of the word analysis today because I want to uh, speak a bit about my teacher, Rabbi Tversky. But here, this closing line, verse 23, is the image that those turn them back, v'yashev alehem, turn back upon them, et onam. And Onam is their wrongs. It can mean their frauds, their, you know, ona, ona atavarim, the same root, is misuse of the tongue. In the, dramatically in the Talmud, in Baba Metzia, tractate that deals with torts, they'll say, you cannot say to a person, how much does an item cost, a merchant, unless you intend to buy it. For that is verbal fraud. You've created an expectation that you don't intend to fulfill. The same word, ona, it's fraud. It's the misuse of tongue also. And primarily, we'll come back to that and point it out in this psalm. Turn it back on them, their wrongs, with their own evil, cut them down. This notion that their own evil will cut them down is a theme we've seen repeatedly already in Psalms. Verse 7, Psalm 7, verse 15. He, referring to an evil person, has dug a pit and hollowed it out and then fell into the ditch which he had made. Or Psalm 10, verse 2. Begu'ut rasha yadlekani with the arrogance of the evil that pursues the weak or the poor, yit pashu bemazmanot zochashvu, let them be caught by the very devices they have devised for others. You find it later in Psalm 141, verses 9 to 10. It's the ultimate comeuppance. In the Talmud, there's a category of retribution, and it's in Hebrew, it's midah keneged midah, which is to say measure for measure, that there should be recompense. Whatever one intended for someone else should happen to one's, to the wrongdoer. <clears throat> and that is the punchline 
of this psalm, which circles back to the very beginning, which is, of course, take action against those who are returned back. The same word, hashev, that's the envelope here. Remember, a key word that's in the beginning and the end, the key, a key word here in verse 2 is turn back. It's reverse what is deserved upon ge'im, the arrogant. And verse 4, and, and verse 3, there's a sense of immediacy, of a threat. So that fuels the sense of rage throughout this psalm with rhetorical questions. Until when the wicked Adonai? Until when will the wicked exalt? There's something going on that evokes for this psalmist a sense of urgency, which will be a bit at odds with the flow of the psalm, in which later he's going to be talking about how God was a source of comfort to him and throughout his life. And yet there's a paradox in this psalm, a sense of trust in God, and at the same time, a sense of where are you, God? Why aren't you here? Appear. That's the word here in verse 1, hophia. Some translations will translate it as shine bright, make yourself known, because there's a gap between the faith in God and the reality of a world of corruption. Here, verse 4, and here's some, a little bit, a taste of the choices of translation. Take the first word, yabi'u. I translate it as freely utter. They freely utter and declare falsehoods. This is describing the arrogance of those with the power. The word yabia is often translated as mutter or express, but Radak points out that Psalm 119, verse 171, tivana, the same root, is used for overflowing of water. So yabiu, the first word in verse 4, is there's this quality of a flow of words. They freely utter, yidabru atak, and declare, I translate, falsehoods. That's Rashi's understanding of the word atak, falsehoods, because it's an obscure word. Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, writing after Rashi, but in the Middle Ages, he'll translate it as strong words. And a more contemporary Hasidic master will say, atak has the root of atik, old. That the falsehood is the assertion that God is feeble, old-like. And instead, the word now, verse 4, yit amru. Here is Irene's beloved Ibn Ezra pointing out that the word, because normally it would be it's in the reflexive. It could be as if they are speaking of themselves. So they're, the, these arrogant, they're constantly self-oriented. They're speaking of themselves. Yit amru. It's a rare kind of use of the word. But Ibn Ezra points out that this word as a root, instead of saying, amar, amir, which appears in Isaiah 17.6 and Deuteronomy 26.17, is the tallest stalk of wheat. And so they are glorifying themselves. They are speaking of themselves as if they are the tallest. They stand above it all. That is the critique of the arrogant. They freely utter and declare falsehoods. They glorify themselves. Such is the nature of the workers of iniquity. And now this, you know, your people, Adonai, so there's a plea to God. Your people, they crush. Your heritage, they afflict. And some people, like Radak, will say that widows and resident aliens, they kill, and orphans, they murder. Those are metaphors. 
not literally, but widows and residents and orphans are throughout the Bible the image of those who lack power, and that is the people of Israel. This psalm was read throughout Jewish history as a description, again, of being in exile and those who speak falsehoods with political power against Israel. And Israel, God, we are like the widow. We are like the orphan. We are like the resident alien. Resident alien. Ger, sometimes interpreted as stranger, but in the Bible itself, it was the immigrant to Israel who had legal status. Later, and more later on, it'll be the word also used for a convert. And so five and six are a plea to God. These arrogant, they misuse their tongues freely against us. And now verse seven. Yeah, and they say, Yah will not see, and the God of Jacob will not discern. This, too, is a reoccurring theme in Psalms, that the evildoer feels free, that there is no accountability, that there is no God of moral right and wrong who, who is morally outraged, a God of vengeances. So they dis they. They feel this quality of unbridled power, of freedom. Yah will not see, and the God of Jacob will not discern. And I need to put a quotation mark here on the other side of this. That's the key plea. And let them discern, boors amidst the people, fools, when will you grow wise? And now in a description again as we shift the, e the lecture to evildoers, verses 8 to 11, then verse 12 to 15, patience for the righteous, happy is the mighty person whom you chastise. This concept of yisurin shal ahava, the afflictions of love that we do suffer, an acknowledgement of suffering, and we grow through the suffering. And that's a whole separate kind of theological conversation to this notion of the love that comes with pain. In Brachot 5a in the Talmud, they'll say three of the core gifts that God provides only come through suffering. And that's the deriving of wisdom from Torah, the conquest of the land of Israel and holding on to it, and acquiring a place in the world to come, each of those require qualities of self-discipline that entails qualities of affliction. Uh, a big topic, verse 12. And now, again, verses 16 to 23, it gets personal, about, with so many of my upsets within me, your comforting soothes my spirit. Verse 19, and I included in the announcement for today's learning, a song by Shefa Gold. But I only have five minutes, and I want to tell you about a song and a wonderful teacher in a Hasidic closing. I had a teacher. I say had, because sadly, my beloved rabbi, Dr. Abraham Tversky, died of COVID on Sunday in Jerusalem, was buried Sunday night, the same day. Abraham Tversky already became a rabbi at the age of 17. On both sides of his family were great Hasidic, the Hasidic masters. He was aristocracy within the Hasidic world by lineage. And he decided that people in America, he was the, his father was the immigrant. He was the first born, born in Milwaukee, where his father was the Hasidic rabbi of Milwaukee with his uncle, the Hasidic rabbi in Chicago, very famous family, the Tversky's. He decided to become a psychiatrist and no less than Danny Thomas, the Lebanese Christian philanthropist actor, gave him a scholarship to put him through medical school. And he became the chief of psychiatry at a large hospital run by nuns in Pittsburgh because they said to him, we want you because you are religious to be the head of this. 
And Abe Tversky had a family that wrote music as part of the Hasidic custom of singing. And Abe Tversky wrote the following melody. La da 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 He taught it to his teenage son 50 some years ago. Abe was 90 years old when he passed, so that was probably 70 years ago. His son taught it to his friends, and it took flight. I had the privilege to be in Maron on Lagba Omer, where hundreds of thousands of people danced in celebration of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's yurtzeit, singing Hoshia et the Mecha, that melody. And I took a video of it two years ago and brought it to my dear teacher to see his melody out. He knows it's out in the world, but in that moment that I had just experienced. And he said to me, when I die, Abe Tversky wrote 70 books. He said, as a psychiatrist who dedicated his career to addictions, my addiction is writing. And he did it every morning from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. And he said, when I die, I want no eulogies. And he was among the most humble of people I've ever known. But I want them to sing that song, Hoshia et the Mecha, because all my ideas, my writing, are ideas I took from other people. I just put it together. The only thing that I know that flew, that passed through me was that melody. It's as if it came from outside of me, but I didn't take it from anybody. It flowed through me. And it was my gift. And I want it to be played when my beer is carried. And in the obituaries that I've read in the Israeli newspapers and in the Jewish papers about Rabbi Tversky, it said that when they carried his casket to the grave on Sunday night of this week, they sang Hoshia et the Mecha, that there were no eulogies. And he said, in explaining it, that his melody had brought joy to so many that he wanted that joy to be part of his farewell. And so the power of a melody and a closing Hasidic story, because he was a Hasid with a long white beard. I posted on my Facebook page a half hour interview done a year ago by some of my cousins who live in Israel with Rabbi Tversky. He was already old, close to 90, but you get a feeling for a great man, a man. He was only a man. But he lived his life as a psychiatrist, working with the down and out, the lowest rung of society, alcoholics, and then drug addicts. And seeing the image of God, he would tell me, and every patient allowed him to do that work. And so he was a chassid, psychiatrist, walking the walk. The Hasidic story, can you turn off the screen share? What? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So the closing Hasidic story honoring my beloved teacher is uh, in the art scroll for Psalm 1. Uh, the following story. They don't have attribution of which Hasidic uh, master. And again, Hasidic masters are our Zen teachers, our storytellers with a moral lesson. Once upon a time, there was a king, and he was in a festive procession through town. And this young boy, this urchin, kind of a down and out kid, took a stone and he threw it toward the carriage of the king and it hit his crown, knocking over the king's crown. And people were outraged by his lack of respect for the king. And they grabbed the boy and there were those who called for the boy to be strung up. And the king said, leave him be, bring him to my palace. And so they brought the boy to the palace. And the king treated him like a member of the household. He gave him good clothes to wear. He would eat with the royal family. And he grew up as if he was in and of that family. 
And it wasn't very long until he began to appreciate how remarkable this family was and how worthy of respect this king was. And he began to feel such shame over how he had disregarded the king and how he had shamed the king by knocking off his crown. And he came to the king and he said, punish me. I know now how terribly I had acted toward you. And the king said, your awareness is your punishment. Let it go. You have paid your price. Live your life to be worthy of the glory. Abe Tversky said, and he wrote 70 books, some for Hazleton, the AA imprint. Betty Ford would invite him to Palm Springs and offer him three different airplane meals um, <laughs> um, because he, for the AA community, was considered the rabbi because of the books he read, wrote about addiction and with compassion of how to deal with the down and out and not to trust them. The book on addiction, which I read, said basically, do not trust an addict. They are liars. But his book, he said in that interview, and he'll say of himself, all of his books come down to one line. Love yourself and know you are worthy of being loved. For he said, in the work he did with alcoholics, what he found is they were self-medicating that ultimately it was their own sense of not feeling worthy of being loved that they were trying to numb. And that he wrote all these books only to say in different ways, find a way to love yourself because God loves you. Feel the love of God as the source of love in the world and then you can live your life fully. Abe Tversky, I had the privilege, it's a long story how I got to know him and become, I'm embarrassed to say to be his friend because he was for me larger than life as somebody who was really exotic, who walked the walk of tending to the lowest and did so with such wisdom and humility. And so I will send you tomorrow, I'll put in the link also for this YouTube, that my cousins filmed with him in January. He was already in a wheelchair and a bit weaker. I've known Abe for about 15 years and his wife, Gail, who is the Dr. Ruth of the ultra Orthodox community, um, remarkable person in her own right. But with that, I pull together our study today of Psalm 94 to say, Hashochat ya'aver enei chachamim. Both in Deuteronomy 16, 19 and in Exodus 23, 8, we are cautioned. A bribe blinds the eyes of the wise. And we are to be aware that there can be evil in the world, that there can be misuse of collective power, and that God is a God of moral outrage when power is used illegitimately to harm the weakest in community. And with that, I will turn it over to Elise to say a closing word before Kaddish, which we're going to say in a moment, um, a closing word honoring your father on his yurt site, Elise, or Stephanie in honor of your grandfather. So go ahead, Elise, a closing word. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, and what an appropriate and timely, but I guess for the Jewish people, it's always timely to speak about social injustice and persecution and the abuse of power. But my father in particular was very much into social justice, and being a teacher would tell me stories about the early days of the teachers' union, I could spend a lot of time discussing my father, very colorful history, of course. Now I am so sorry that I did not ask him more questions, that I did not listen more astutely to what he said, but thank you very much. And in reference I'm, uh, to Rabbi Tversky, um, when I was growing up in the Bronx, 
um, on, uh, across from the Grand Concourse uh, between my apartment building, the apartment building where I lived and the, the house that my grandparents, my mother's parents lived in, which was like 10 blocks away. There was a little building with a sign in the window for Rabbi Tversky. Now I do know they were a very prominent family and I cannot remember which Tversky it was, but always oh, see Rabbi Tversky in, in a sign in the window. So I don't know if uh, it wasn't a bona fide shul because I don't remember crowds going in or out, but there was a Tversky in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Also, if memory serves, and again, I don't know if I read this or saw an interview, but I believe it was Rabbi Tversky who uh, made it okay for the priests or other uh, religious leaders who had um, an alcohol issue to do the, uh, to use um, fruit juice, grape mm -hmm. juice or other juices to substitute for wine. He gave it the okay. So I was kind of impressed and I believe it was for priests because when I heard that I said, well, why is he helping priests? Now, from what you had uh, explained, I have a better picture. Well, let me say, at least that one of the many books that Rabbi Tversky wrote was about the nuns. He wrote a book about his about the nuns he worked uh -huh. with for so many years. One other thing, and then we'll say Kaddish. He also wrote a book about um, physical violence by husbands against their wives in the ultra Orthodox community. And he was he wrote it because somebody in his family had been abused in a marriage. He wrote a book about how this was something ignored as a problem in the ultra orthodox community. And he needed bodyguards for the next several years when he spoke publicly, because there were those in the religious community who felt that he had shamed his community. He had that quality of courage and outrage, moral outrage against wrongs. Again, he was only human in so many ways, and he was larger than life to me, and is truly that rare person who was a tzaddik. When we use the word tzaddik, somebody who lived and walked the talk of moral courage and divine care, um, such was his life. And Elise, I'm glad again today to honor your father, Simon Birnbaum. We now turn to the saying of Kaddish for our loved ones. Um, and then a close. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah. Biyama libra kirute biyamlech mahute b'chaye chon u'yomechon u'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael. Ba'agalah yizman kariz vimru amen. Yehei rabba mebarach le'olam ome omaya. Yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitbar v'yitroman v'yitnase v'yitadar v'yale v'yitalal shemei dekutsha v'richu. Alenu Kol Yisrael Kol Yoshevei Tevel Vimru Amen. Thanks to each of you for joining today. Tomorrow we begin the Psalms of Kabbalat Shabbat, the service that welcomes Shabbat begins with um, Psalm ninety-five to ninety-nine, and those what are the Psalms we'll be doing in the days to come. To each, thank you. You thank put. You. Joy in my heart. Be well. <laughs>